Good evening. My name is Ted Landsmark, and you are now a part uh, of this week's MyraCraft Open Classroom. This semester, we've been uh, taking a look at the role that design plays in uh, shaping and transforming environments, and we've been doing this work uh, in conjunction with the Rudy Bruner Foundation. And uh, I remind folks that uh, these meetings are uh, being uh, recorded and archived, and you can uh, spread the word that if someone misses a session, uh, it's available at both the Rudy Bruner site and at the uh, Dukakis Center site at Northeastern. Uh, and with that, I will uh, turn the room over to my colleague, Anne-Marie Lubinow. Thank you, Ted. I'm Anne-Marie Lubinow, and I'm the director of the Rudy Bruner Award for Urban Excellence at the Bruner Foundation. And we're delighted to be partnering with TED, Northeastern University, and the Myra Craft Open Classroom this semester. The Rudy Bruner Award is a national design award that recognizes transformative urban places that contribute to the economic, environmental, and social vitality of American cities. And this semester, we're tapping into our network of 88 Rudy Bruner Award winners to share the stories of innovative initiatives and projects from cities across America. Tonight, we're gonna to hear from a team of people involved in the creation of La Crete's Innovation Campus, a 2017 Rudy Bruner Award Silver Medalist, which is a clean tech incubator and demonstration facility in downtown Los Angeles, California. The LEAP Platinum facility is part of a broader effort to promote innovation, job creation, and workforce development along with a culture of sustainability in Los Angeles. The project was made possible by a public-private partnership led by the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, the largest publicly owned utility in, in the United States. And we'll also hear from the leader of the Boston Green Ribbon Commission, a local network of business and civic leaders supporting implementation of the City of Boston's Climate Action Plan. Once again, we are partnering with the Boston Society of Architects to offer AIA continuing education credits. Please use the link that we'll put in the chat box to submit your name and member number. Tonight's presenters include Alice Kim, who's the founding co-principal of John Friedman Alice Kim Architects in Los Angeles. And their firm actually are the architects of two Rudy Bruner Award winners. The firm's work includes education institutional facilities, creative commercial ventures, housing, and civic environments. Alice has been responsible for a number of the firm's award-winning projects, including LaCrette's Innovation Campus. She's also a longtime educator and served as USC's Director of Undergraduate Architecture and is a graduate of Harvard GSD. Kelly Bernard is the Chief Executive for the Los Angeles Metro Area for AECOM. Previously, she served as Deputy Mayor of Economic Development for Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti. And as Director of Economic Development at the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, Kelly led the Clean Technology Initiative, which culminated in the development of LaCrette's Innovation Campus. And she has a master's degree in urban planning from UCLA. Ben Stapleton is the Executive Director of USGBCLA. And before joining USGBC LA, Ben launched and managed the LaCrette's Innovation Campus and served as second vice president for operation and finance for the LA Clean Tech Incubator. He's also the former managing director of the LA Better Buildings Challenge and holds an MBA from USC's Marshall School of Business. And joining us from Boston tonight as a respondent is John Cleveland, the executive director of the Boston Green Ribbon Commission. He's also the president and co-founder of the Innovation Network for Communities, a nonprofit focused on social innovation and large scale change, especially in ways communities are responding to climate change. John's also the author of Life After Carbon, The Next Global Transformation of Cities, which describes how cities are leading efforts to convert the threats of climate change into opportunities. Tonight, as on other nights, we'll begin with brief presentations from Alice, Kelly, and Ben about LaCrette's La Innovation Campus, then we'll pivot to a conversation with the three of them and John before turning to audience Q&A. Please remember to use the Q&A box to submit your questions and we look forward to an engaging conversation. So now I will turn this over to Alice, Kelly and Ben. Thank you. Um, so I'm Alice Kim. I'm gonna just uh, really briefly on behalf of all three of us, we are really happy to be here to talk about a very special project. We're gonna start by showing a 
two minute video, a really short video that will actually just kind of introduce the campus to you all. And then um, Kelly will speak for a little bit about uh, the project, how it was conceived and executed by the city of LA. I'll speak about design and then Ben will speak about um, bringing the facility to life, which he very well did. So we'll look forward to it. And I'm just gonna start the... Alice, you muted yourself. All right. The La Crutz Innovation Campus is kind of meant to be a living lab. So a lot of the companies that exist in there actually test out their ideas and their technologies in the building. So the building really is kind of a test bed. It's sort of living and breathing what it says it's doing. I think it was built in the early 1900s. It used to be a fabrics warehouse for a furniture manufacturing company called Barker Brothers. It was a classic opportunity where we could preserve the carbon footprint of this old building, we could transform it, and we could actually make it this community hub. There's 300 people that walk through this campus every week. The way that it was designed, it allows a lot of events to happen at the same time. I've heard stories of how this place has made an impact on people's health, saved the relationships that they have in other parts of their lives because they're able to come someplace and not feel so isolated and be able to build friendships and end up collaborating on projects, coming up with ideas to do things that could really make LA the leader in the world for sustainability. Alice? Yeah. It's a very cool awesome place video. to yeah. hang out. So when yeah. you first walk okay. in, the first thing you see is a living wall. People often wonder if it's fake plants, right, but you know it's what? not. It's I'm going to stop sharing. Sorry. These things happen. The joys yeah. of technology. It was it's not a good event without one technology, technology challenge. Yeah. OK, why is it not? I stopped sharing. It should stop talking. Um, let's see. What it's worth, Alice, you're a world-renowned architect, not, a, not an IT manager, so it's, it's okay. <laughs> we all feel that it's a kind of an honor to come be able We can hear it, but not. Yeah, it won't let me stop sharing, though. That's what's strange. I keep pressing that button. Ben Maybe Harold, quote. are you there? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, well, the ice, right? Okay. Tech support is here. Yeah, you can ben. always close, if you close the application fully, maybe Alice, and then yeah. reopen it, yeah. and then just share the application. Maybe that'll that'll help. Yeah. We saw the beginning of it. Yeah, it looked like you maybe clicked out of it or something <laughs> happened after that. All right. Shall I replay it since it's short? Yeah, go yeah. back to the beginning. Definitely. All right, let's go back. There it the is. Okay. And I swear, I'm not even going to breathe. <laughs> um, breathe. Keep breathing. Yeah. That's <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, the play button is hidden here. Okay. There we go. The La Crutz Innovation Campus is kind of meant to be a living lab. So a lot of the companies that exist in there actually test out their ideas and their technologies in the building. So the building really is kind of a test bed. It's sort of living and breathing what it says it's doing. I think it was built in the early 1900s. It used to be a fabrics warehouse for a furniture manufacturing company called Barker Brothers. It was a classic opportunity where we could preserve the carbon footprint of this old building, we could transform it, and we could actually make it this community hub. There's 300 people that walk through this campus every week. The way that it was designed, it allows a lot of events to happen at the same time. I've heard stories of how this place has made an impact on people's health, saved the relationships that they have in other parts of their lives because be able to come someplace and not feel so isolated and be able to build friendships and end up collaborating on projects, coming up with ideas to do things that could really make LA the leader in the world for sustainability. 
It's a very cool place to hang out. So when you first walk in, the first thing you see is a living wall. People often wonder if it's fake plants, but it's not. It's actually a living, breathing green wall. In addition to photovoltaic cells, we have bioswales on the outside. We have photovoltaic canopy covering the parking. It comes back to this idea of an integrated sustainability where it's all really part of the culture and the way of life. This project was not a short project, was not an easy project, but it was definitely well worth it. It is indeed a, a first of its kind. And I think it has had a huge impact on the city, not just the clean tech ecosystem, but the city at, at large. We all feel that it's a kind of an honor to come be able to work at the LaCretz Innovation Campus. Success. All right, now I gotta shut this down. <laughs> Okay. I hope everyone enjoyed that. And Kelly, it's your turn now. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, I don't have any video to share. Um, thank you, Alice. Thank you, Anne-Marie and Ted for inviting us here to really um, talk about a um, project that I can't believe it's been 10 or 15 years now since we, uh, since it was first conceived. Um, I played uh, different roles um, on this project. It was conceived really um, by Mayor Antonio Villaraigosa and his economic development team. Um, they were going to, the plan was to leverage um, the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, which as Anne Marie said, is the largest municipal um, utility company to leverage its resources to really be a catalyst for um, creating a clean tech ecosystem in Los Angeles. And so we needed to find kind of a brick and mortar place to kind of root that, that strategy, that economic development strategy. And so um, out of that desire and vision to use uh, clean tech as a uh, catalyst for green jobs and sustainable, and sustainable development, um, the clean tech incubator was, was born and it required the partnership of many people. Um, when I came into the project in 2000, 11, I was director of um, economic development for the Department of Water and Power. And I inherited from um, John Shin, my uh, predecessor at DWP, who had the wherewithal to figure out how to um, purchase this site um, and then use DWP and partner with our redevelopment agency um, to find a project manager. And that's what we did, or that's who we found in the former redevelopment agency. So you have this vision uh, from the public sector. Uh, and then we understood that in order for it to happen, we were going to need partners. And then, and so with that, um, there was a partnership or an MOU, uh, Memorandum of Understanding, um, that was signed by many of the major universities and research institutions in the area, including USC, Caltech, UCLA, JPL, and then a number of the business organizations, the Los Angeles Chamber of Commerce, the uh, County's Economic Development Corporation, uh, Los Angeles Business Council. So all of these groups who had their own, um, heretofore, had their own agendas and all of that came together to really um, support this great vision and this great idea. And um, it's, again, it started with Mayor Antonio Villaraigosa, but it was a very long development process and it continued through the, uh, the next mayor, Mayor Garcetti, which doesn't ha often happen. You know, the, the priorities of one administration, if anything, it becomes the thing that the next administration completely runs from that, you know, wanting to put their own stamp on it. But I think what was unique about this project or what is unique about this project is that it um, superseded any kind of politics. It was just about this is what's needed and good for um, not just the art district, but the Los Angeles um, in general. So uh, every, we, we were all aligned around um, the vision and the process, and then the fun part uh, started to happen of how do you develop this? How do you finance it? Um, how do you uh, project manage it? We ha I always said we had over 12 different funding sources, but in looking at some of the case studies, I'm reminded that there were quite a few more than 12 um, uh, funding sources. We used um, new market tax credits. 
which was something very new to the city of Los Angeles. This was probably one of the first projects in the city that, that leveraged um, new market tax credits. And, and by first meaning the first publicly supported one. We used uh, former bonds that came out of the 2000 recovery, um, the economic recovery bond program. So that was helpful. DWP was represented about 42% of the funding for the project between land acquisition and, um, and, and, and program dollars. And then we had community development block grants. So we cobbled together every source of funding we could find to keep this project um, alive and moving forward. Oftentimes it was, it felt like it was on life support. I know I felt like I was on life support. Um, <laughs> the way that we, you know, just had to keep like pumping life into this project. And so uh, we had great, again, we had great partners and, and, and JFAC and Alice and her team to keep us on track because I will be honest, there were times where I was like, Alice, I, I need you to value engineering this design. And I mean, do we really need a living wall? Like it's not necessary, that could save me, you know, $2 million or whatever it was, but, but every, cause every penny was painful to come by. Um, but she kept us true to the vision um, and, and was really clear about, we weren't just building four walls to, for an incubator, that we were creating a place and that the design could not be compromised for the sake of the, the financing or uh, to be short-sighted. So um, while at times it was, uh, it was trying, I am glad that um, she kept us honest and, uh, and on point around how we develop this. And so, again, it was a labor of love. It required uh, multiple city departments to come together that normally don't. So if um, the Department of Water and Power self-performs, it's the largest municipal organization, they are very prideful, they you know, self-perform and they build transmission sy systems, but they're not real estate developers. They're not project managers of this sort. And so, um, using my experience in the city of having worked in the city um, 10 years prior to that, I uh, reached out to old friends in, our, in the city's kind of construction management unit, Bureau of Engineering, and asked if they would enter into an agreement with DWP and project manage it. It was unheard of. And um, I think it caught a lot of our colleagues uh, in the city by surprise that uh, LADWP would allow this to happen. And I don't know that they allowed it as opposed to just, we kind of snuck it in and before they knew it, they that's what they were saying yes to. And that was a life-saving uh, moment as well. And that having those um, professional engineers and project managers out of our uh, Bureau of Engineering manage this project um, was really helpful. They are pros at what they do. And so between coming up with the financing and then having a professional project manager, um, it really just helped the project uh, move along. And so I kind of stepped out once we got the finance um, together and it was time for construction. That was at a point where I had transitioned from the LADWP, Mayor Garcetti, who was council president, um, was elected mayor and asked me to come join his administration as deputy mayor. And so I transitioned. I kind of kept the project with me just to make sure it didn't, this, the city continued its support. Um, and so again, I, I, I transitioned over to the mayor's office. Um, there are a few people who I've not mentioned, Steve Andrews, um, who would be great to have. He um, was another city worker who had who wore multiple hats in multiple city departments. Um, when I started at the mayor's office, I made sure Steve stayed on the program and he kept an eye out on it while I could go and, and, and do my new responsibilities um, and that. And then it was up to Steve and Alice and the guys over at BOE to really uh, move it through construction. and. You know, I kept asking them, just don't, you know, don't let the building fall down because it, it was, it was, you know, tough. And then just get it done and let me know when the groundbreaking is. That's all I wanted to know. And so that they did. So that was kind of the early stages of it where it was envisioned and then how it got to construction and happy to answer questions, but that was it. It was a roller coaster, as Kelly says. Um, Anne Marie, should we um, should Kelly take a couple questions before we move on, or should we just move on and then take questions or at the end? My instinct is to just move ahead. Okay, Ted, would you agree? Yeah. Okay, great. 
So unfortunately, I have to share my screen again because I'm an architect and therefore I have to have my visual crutches with me. So hopefully I won't screw up this time because it is not a video, but let's see if I can get my screen together here. Does everybody see my screen? <laughs> I hope. Yes. Okay. I am now in full screen mode, so I hope everyone sees this. This is when it usually breaks down is when I transition to full screen. But um, so Kelly, I think, sort of painted a picture that was very accurate in the sense that this really was kind of a roller coaster. Um, the time frame for us was a little shorter than hers, but it was long nonetheless. The project for us lasted from being selected as an architect in 2000, late 2010 to um, mid 2017 when we were still kind of closing out elements of the project. So it really was a long uh, lasting project with a lot of complexity. Um, but time does go fast when you're having fun. But I do wanna say, I, I kind of wanna just, you know, once in a while we remind ourselves that there are these very foundational reasons why La Crete's Innovation Campus was brought into being, um, which we can't forget. And um, it's not, just about jobs creation and helping LA's economy, but it's really also in existence because the world that we live in is so fragile. You know, we face so many challenges today. We can't deny them. We can't run away from them. And, um, you know, just once in a while, we have to remind ourselves of those things. And four broad categories of challenges that I always think about are unstable governments. I'm just gonna run through these images quickly, poverty, overpopulation. And then the one that we it was closest to us at La Crete's was um, kind of environmental decay. But all of these issues are interconnected. And as much as we might really want to fool ourselves into thinking that their ex more extreme effects are far removed from us, you know, every single day we see evidence that this is just simply not true. So, you know, we read the writing of activists and writers such as Naomi Klein. And, you know, she does a great job of also making us understand that all of these issues are related to social justice and that community and collective action can really work to mitigate the downward spiral in which we find ourselves. Um, the pandemic, of course, has really magnified all of these things. Um, aside from bringing so much loss to the entire world and so much sorrow, the pandemic has also made even more visible all of the inequities in our society. So from race to gender, to environment, to housing and education, our cities are really a reflection of how these inequities play out across um, all of these areas and also how everything again is so inseparable. So La Crete's Innovation Campus was not designed with a pandemic in mind, obviously, but the existence of places like this will help the city of LA once the pandemic is under control because it actually has become a place where community government and technological entrepreneurship have really connected um, and found common ground. Um, I think Ben is actually going to speak to this quite a bit. So for us, the design of the physical space was really important um, in that it promote a shared culture in which sustainability is not just a word anymore, but is really a lifestyle and resilience also, not just a word, but really a life goal. So um, that is kind of how we looked at it. And another way that we liked to look at it was to think about the powers of 10. And I don't know if, if some of you or all of you have seen this film. These are stills from this great film, Powers of 10 by Charles and Ray Eames, the mid-century Los Angeles architects which illustrates how everything is connected in the universe. So if you look at the bottom right-hand corner and you see these atoms and those atoms are actually in your hand and your hand belongs to your arm and your arm belongs to your body and you're lying on a picnic blanket and you just zoom out, zoom out, zoom out until you're looking at kind of the universe. And it really is this lesson that we have to remember that humanity is all connected and um, the universe is really connected. So, when we think about sustainability, and we know that it encompasses the economic, environmental, and social life of a city, and but that now, because of technology, this has become magnified into a whole global community, we think about what that means for architecture. And we believe that architecture and design is really a tool to inspire people and help 
make lives better. And so all of these things kind of come together in ways that are not always visible, but we know that if we can just design good spaces within the cities that we live in, we can actually promote um, a more equitable, just, and hopefully environmentally sound um, environment for all of us to live in together. So at La Cretz, um, uh, you know, back in 2000, whatever it was, seven, um, when Kelly started working on this project, there was a common set of ideas uh, that Mayor Villaragosa outlined um, that sort of um, generated a vision for Los Angeles's clean technology future. That, that vision was all about creating jobs. It was about becoming a le leader in the new green economy. It was about innovation. Um, and so there was this idea that you could take this five mile swath of land uh, downtown, and you can actually turn it into a clean technology corridor of which an innovation campus of some sort, a physical facility, would become the centerpiece. Um, for us, the interesting thing was that they, this group of people, this consortium of universities and thinkers and leaders and policymakers, came up with the arts district as the location for this for this innovation campus. And for us, that was kind of brilliant because it really brings to life or it brought to life the idea that creativity and innovation cannot exist without each other. And that artfulness on the one hand and performance on the other really lead to a kind of beauty that is what sustainability really is all about. So when we look at an aerial view of the site before the project was constructed, you know, it was quite messy, but you had this very vibrant new loft building, uh, live work um, loft building across the way. And you had this incredible <laughs> restaurant here in this corner called Earth Cafe, which single-handedly seemed to be revitalizing the economy of Los Angeles downtown. I mean, really just, it was just one of these places that had become a community hub in and of itself. So the question was, what do you do with this structure, which was the structure that had been kind of pinpointed as being the new innovation campus site. And um, the structure was, it's really actually eight separate warehouse structures, masonry structures, and they somehow had to become connected and unified. And the goals that we had for this project were really to, again, create a sense of community within the campus, but also to make the campus a community center for the city. Um, the question was also, how do you give this new community center its own identity? How do you sort of celebrate the values of sustainability and make it part of a new kind of culture? How do you express the technologies that make that happen physically? Um, how do you really just transform things and technologies and resources and materials in, in ways that um, will really help to promote creativity and innovation um, and thereby really uh, engender change. And then finally, of course, education and outreach became a very important goal of, of the innovation campus. And one of the things that was super important to the architecture as well was the idea of the public-private partnership. Because the LADWP, which is a utility, um, was the owner and one of the main tenants of the project, and then the main tenant of the project was this LA Clean Tech Incubator, which we call LACI, L-A-C-I. And they were the ones who were basically a business incubator, bringing in companies to innovate, ideate, research, and do all of these things. How could we actually take those two things and make it into a, an idea for a building? And um, one of the things that you know we talked about very at extensively with Fred Walty, who was the first CEO of um, LA Clean Tech Incubator, you saw him in the video, was the idea that this was going to be the first facility of its kind in the United States where the, the loop of innovation, again, starting with uh, you have an idea, you research that idea, you test the idea, you prototype it, you, you, um, you then test the prototype, and then you have um, people helping you with marketing and business plans, and then you're able to push it out to the world. That kind of closed loop of innovation was all going to be together under one roof. And, um, and the LADWP was going to become kind of a vehicle in which to exhibit some of these um, 
um, ideas that would be brought to life here. And so all of that was really important in the way we started to think about the physical spaces, how to make them interactive and flexible, how to give them varying degrees of privacy because there were intellectual property issues at, at hand, there was work productivity and um, you know lots of things coming together. And of course, how do we integrate sustainability and technology in a way that also kind of promotes this innovation? But backgrounding all of that was our initial idea at the interview stage when we hadn't even gotten the project, which uh, of how do we open up the structure made up of these eight warehouses, these eight closed warehouses, how do we open it up so that it, it again connects back to the city. And um, we had a lot of ideas. One of them was to create a public plaza or amphitheater or small park that connects the Earth Cafe, that, that revolutionary restaurant, to um, the campus um, and to create kind of a public street that cuts through the campus. That actually didn't happen, but something we came as close as we could. So once we started designing the project, um, funding was not really available for this part of the building at the moment when we started. So really what we were doing was we were designing the LA Clean Tech Incubator spaces for this part of the building. And what was interesting is once we laid out kind of this um, variety of open and closed spaces, we started to think about that loop that I was talking about and sort of equate it to designing a small town. Um, and a small town of course has its main street that runs through it. And then it has kind of circulation loops that run around it and connect to that main street. And then a town has usually some sort of a town square where events and important um, activities take place. So that was really how we designed this facility. And you can see places like this and this and this where we actually had to cut through these existing very heavy walls. Um, those are very expensive openings to create. So we really did our best to make it feel like um, all of the spaces were connected and unified and had always been one space. But again, the main street, the circulation loop, the town center, those were all really important. Off of that main street were all of the more public spaces of conference rooms, boardroom, break room, again, the event space, and then the entrance area where people come in and are welcomed, and then the director and um, the assistant director of LACI who were right here at the entrance. And then as you move east into this area, as you move further into the building, it becomes more private. The other thing that was really of concern to us was natural light. Really the biggest source of natural light was here along this east wall. And what we wanted to do was bring the light as far west as we could. And so we sort of modulated the open and closed spaces to allow for the light to travel all the way through to the west. So those were just a couple of the important design thinking transformations that we put in place. Um, what you don't see is all of the kind of high performance equipment that also went into the building. It was really strongly felt that if this building were, assist, were about clean technology, it really had to walk the walk and talk the talk. So it is a LEED Platinum building. It is also the first building in the United States that achieved both LEED Platinum certification and a newer certification called Well Building. And it received the highest level um, of that certification, which was gold. So um, in sort of an ad hoc way, during construction over the course of two, two years of construction, we added more program into that bottom part of the building. I say bottom, but it's actually just the west half of the building. Um, as the LA Department of Water and Power got used to the idea that they were gonna occupy the space and they gave us more, pro more and more program to design. LACI also decided to expand and we created a maker space and labs and what became their advanced prototyping center, which was mentioned in the video. And um, I bring up the APC because this advanced prototyping center has a model where they sell memberships to the community. So my office, which is a few blocks away from this facility, we can buy a membership at the APC and we can come and use their laser cutters and water jet cutters. We can actually um, participate in the life of this building as part of this community of makers. And so that is also kind of um, a really innovative and, and groundbreaking programming element that they brought to life here. So I'm just going to end by 
going through some photographs, but this is the way the building actually came to life. Um, in the parking lot, there is a big, a large bioswale here, and um, there is a large shade structure for the parked cars that actually holds um, quite a large array of photovoltaic cells. Um, you can see them here close up. And then the entry is really, um, you're entering into the LACI as well as the LADWP spaces. This is that green wall that Kelly was talking about. It's the waiting area for the building. This green wall has actually become kind of the selfie wall for the project. Everyone gets their picture taken there before they leave. Um, you come in, you're, you check in at the lobby, and then again, you can go to the waiting area and you can wait there or you can proceed into the, into the building. This is the view from inside that waiting area. You travel down that main street and you get to this event space. The event space is, is nice because you can have events there with, with up to 120 people, but you can also just have lunch there by yourself or work there by yourself at any given point in time. And then the open spaces again, punctuated by closed spaces for more privacy and open spaces. Critical once more was the way natural light could get from this east wall all the way into the building to the west. Um, the main street, as we call it, culminates in this kind of open break area with information and, and, and media there for, for people. Um, boardroom also located at the end of that Main Street, and then moving to the other half of the building, just some quick uh, view, a quick view of the LADWP exhibition space, um, where they can also have events, rotating exhibitions, um, speaker series, things like that. And then finally, this is the makerspace uh, of LACI. This is again, part of that advanced prototyping center. So some of these people might just be members from the community who have a very reasonable membership and can come in and use this very sophisticated equipment um, to make things, test things, prototype things. Uh, during the pandemic, the APC actually was pumping out many, many thousands of um, PPE items for distribution to local hospitals. So they really put their um, um, skills and their tools to use during that time. So I just wanted to end by saying that, you know, our attitude towards designing any project really comes down to the fact that as architects, and I think that this project actually helped us to really kind of um, solidify this thinking, we really feel like we bring to the table a very unique ability to integrate requirements of site, program, budget, and environmental responsibility, and to kind of conjoin them into a very holistic vision that balances the need for performance with the elevation of the human experience. That's what we strive for. We don't believe that there is any such thing as 100% performance or 100% aesthetics. It's really about finding out what the right balance is for a particular project. And then this is just, um, this is one of my favorite um, images of um, people getting their, you know, taking their picture in front of the selfie wall. This is, this is, this is the guy who works. This is Eddie who works at the campus. Is that his name, Ben? I can't remember, but it's just hilarious. He's just having such a fun time. And then President Biden actually a few years ago um, was at an event uh, in that event space. And this is Fred Walty, who you saw, and this is Mayor Garcetti. I'm sure Kelly is here somewhere too, but I don't know where she is. So, so I'm gonna end there. And let me just uh, remind folks that uh, we are open for questions. Please type them into the Q&A box uh, and we will get to as many as we can. Um, hopefully all of them. And um, one of the first questions come in before you go on with the presentation is, uh, how many square feet um, are there set aside for the makerspace? I think the makerspace, Ben, do you remember how big the makerspace yeah, is? I would say it's about 9,000 square yeah. feet. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so ben. So who's next, Ben? Ben is next. Uh, yes, so thank you for having me today, and, and it's always a pleasure to present on this project with Alice and Kelly. I, I feel pretty blessed uh, to have had the opportunity to work on, on something like this. Um, so my name, is, my name is Ben Stapleton. I'm the Executive Director with the U.S. Green Building Council, Los Angeles. Um, 
we're an independent nonprofit. So we're, you know, while we're affiliated with the, the National Green Building Council, you may know and love, uh, our mission is really to accelerate sustainability in the built environment here in, in Southern California. Um, I'm going to tell a little bit of my story coming into this project because I always think it's it's helpful to, to, to hear those those sort of personal details. But um, I, I really wholeheartedly dove into the, the clean tech scene probably back in uh, probably as early as 2005, 2006. I was getting my MBA at night while working in commercial real estate. Um, and around that time, developed a, a business model for a media and technology uh incubator and, and shared workspace um, that I, I went around and actually tried to raise money for a little bit after business school, decided I wasn't the right person and it was the right time. I ended up starting a, a clean technology practice group at my firm, JLL, at that time. Uh, and my goal was to really become the sort of green green real estate guy in LA. That was my, that was my, my goal. Um, and it was funny because I met Fred and, and Neil who uh, founded, founded the LA Clean Tech Incubator, uh, I want to say probably in 2010. I was introduced to them as the, the green real estate guy you should probably talk to at some point. And uh, we ended up talking and at the time they were putting together a, an RFP to respond to this, um, this, this bid to, to actually put together a, a clean tech incubator. Uh, and we ended up meeting once and I was like, hey, I'd worked on this project you know, a few years ago for, for something sort of similar to this. I had this whole business model and, and thing I put together, you know, and they're like, well, would you mind sharing that with us? And I said, no, and then we ended up meeting like four or five more times. And we ended up taking a lot of my model and, and uh, putting that into their RFP. And, and they were just great people to work with. And uh, they ended up bringing me on as, as an advisor. And of course, a couple of years ago, you know, they were, you know, obviously the Lacretz campus had been part of sort of the intent of this from the beginning. They were like, oh, you're a real estate guy. You know, can you help us uh, kind of figure out what we're going to do on our end regarding this project? And I said, sure. And I, I did that for free for a couple of years. And then at some point I was like, you know, you guys really should probably pay someone to do some of this. It's a lot, it's starting to become a lot of work. Uh, and then they was like, hey, can we pay you? And I said, sure, I guess so. And I'll, I'll, do, I'll do this. I had some other things I was, I was doing at the time. Uh, and then uh, probably a year after that, I was like, you know, this is really a lot of work. You probably should hire somebody to, to do this. And they were like, hey, can we hire you? And I said, sure, that, that, that sounds great. I'd love to work with you guys. So I, I think the story is a little bit important just because I, I come from the private sector and they've been working really on a wide variety of, of commercial real estate projects, conversions, uh, doing a lot of work on the tenor upside, working with companies that were doing manufacturing or um, you know, creative office, whatever that might be. And one of the things I think is so key about this project, and it's, it's part of why I was so inspired to work on it, I'm, I'm a native Angelino, is that so many people who had the opportunity to work on this or pass, you know, pass their desk, it's this vision of having a place where people could come together and it would be greater than a sum of its parts and they would work together to make the world a better place. And um, I think that vision is so important because I probably have done, I, may, I don't think I'm exaggerating here, maybe two, two, 2,000 tours, 2,500 tours of that building, maybe more. There was a time when I did three or four tours a day for years of that building. Um, I would convey that vision to people who were there and either people would get it and would click or it wouldn't. And for the people who it clicked with, you could tell there was this desire to do everything they could to help make this successful because they also believe in its ability to be transformative here for the region. And uh, I do think this project has been transformative for the region, it's been transformative for people, for companies, for relationships. And so much of that comes back to, to community. And uh, I had the unique opportunity to be the person representing uh, Lacey, figuring out how are, we gonna, how are we gonna program this space? You know, Alice did a phenomenal job of, of designing the space. Uh, you know, Kelly, you know, structuring all the complicated things on the, on the private, public private side to get it, get it to, to exist. Uh, you know, her team did, did those things. And so uh, I was in this unique position where I figured out, well, well, how are we gonna make this work? And so I, you know, I built the business models really for the, the co-working side and for the prototyping center, which uh, to work on the prototyping center, especially at that time, which when maker spaces were still kind of becoming a thing, uh, a ton of learning and uh, really, really unique uh, environment we have there with some special equipment that was not easy to get and that was funded by the EDA uh, and dealt with a ton of issues that you can imagine around you know patents and safety and you name it with people working in that shared space but um, at the end of the day I, I was really really focused on community and, and how we build community within those walls I, I went out and recruited some other nonprofits around LA and companies around LA to, to cohabitate there with us um, because I felt like they would also share in our vision of that space. And, um, 
you know, I think that gets lost a lot of times these days, you know, there's this concept of placemaking, right? And oftentimes uh, people will design a place, but how you bring it to life, I think is just as important. And I had this unique window where, you know, I, I sat in the trailer in the front parking lot for several years as we kind of, you know, moved through the project and getting it built there, but to get into it and then actually be tasked with managing it, doing the business model, figuring out the, the operational side and, uh, you know, having to, to make sure the building got cleaned and, and was secure and all the little things that kind of go into it, um, you start to realize the nuance of a place and the art that goes into placemaking that, that is not a science. Um, but it, it really comes down to, to people uh, and intention and, and how you communicate that. And uh, I meant when I said in that video, that building has such a, had such a positive impact on, on a lot of people who've been there. Uh, I've literally had people tell me that it, it helped, you know, save, save them, you know, just in terms of being part of that community and that connection. And if you think about all we've experienced during this pandemic in the last year of being isolated, being alone, being stuck in environments we didn't think we would be working in and realizing how they're impacting us. Um, to Alice, Alice's point about, you know, sustainability in space, um, our, the spaces we inhabit have such a profound impact on us that we don't even understand completely yet you know, how much natural light we have, a connection to people, having access to nature like a green wall in the space. Um, you know, how do we collaborate with people and, and how do you foster that? And there's data that shows the design of space, the, the aspects that, 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 you know, affect your health, whether it's indoor air quality or natural light or access to nature, those, those enhanced productivity, those re reduced sick days. And I think this building is just a great example of those things coming together and maybe making people more productive uh, making innovation happen faster, making collaboration be more exciting. You know, all these things are small, but meaningful and actually equate to real dollars at the end of the day. Uh, and so uh, I think that's important to, to bring uh, to, to this process a bit. And um, I want to get back to one thing that, that Alice touched on as well, which is that closed loop process. Um, this really is the only building, uh, in fact, still the only one that I've, I know of in the world where you actually have uh, a large utility cohabitating with a nonprofit that's focused on innovation in a co-working space. If you think about that, having a utility with a co-working space uh, where you're having events, you're having you know, meetings, you're having that collaborative workflow. And then that flows into this maker space where you know, I, I was really intentional about bringing in people who weren't necessarily clean tech people. So artists, you know, people who do manufacturing, we needed that community there that has those hard skill sets mixing with that clean technology community and then mixing with the utility. That, that's really where the innovation happens when people get out of their silo and their sphere. And that's that closed loop system, even down to, to the utility having their testing labs there and then having a, a space there to engage the public uh, through education and exhibits. You know, you're, you're doing the, the, the ideation, the creation, the prototyping, the testing, and then the education all in that closed loop. And uh, that is really a, a, a beautiful thing. So I'll, I'll stop there. I could probably keep, keep going on, but I just wanted to, to bring some of that to the conversation. Thank you, Ben. If I could jump in, I know just from uh, spending time at La Carrette's during our site visit, it was interesting to learn about the different types of organizations within the building. So could you just provide a few examples of the nonprofits and also briefly discuss the the role of the incubator in growing these businesses? Absolutely. So um, first of all, I think the, it's a, the mix is really important. So it, it's not, you know, the LA Clean Tech Incubator is a nonprofit, but we went and specifically chose some of the other groups that we felt like were really leading uh, in LA from a non nonprofit standpoint. So, uh, and they might not necessarily be clean tech related. So I'll, I'll use Ciclavia as an example. Uh, Ciclavia, for those of you who don't know, uh, they basically organize uh, these large scale events around LA where they close down streets and open them up for people to bike ride uh, on that day, you know, from beginning to end, and really have people experience the city in a new and, and different way. And it really activates those communities. Um, they were cohabitating with us. We went and recruited a group called Climate Resolve, uh, which is a real leader for advocacy in the state of California around environmental issues, recruited them to, to join with us. River LA, which was leading a lot of development along the LA River, recruited them to cohabitate with us. And then uh, private sector companies, you know, one of my goals for a long time was to try to get um, those groups that maybe they're a large company, but they had a, a sales office in LA or they're a large company and they had a, an architect or an engineer who was based in LA, but they were working in the space. Well, we want those people in the community because first of all, they're isolated, kind of working by themselves for a large company, but that connection, that thread with that larger company is incredibly valuable. 
Uh, and that's incredibly valuable for the startups, frankly, that, that are in the space. And so in, in terms of, of, of Lacey's role, um, you know, we would go out and, and recruit companies um, that we felt like could make, a, make an impact. Uh, you know, we would, we would get applications all the time and, and they, would, they would pitch to us at, about, you know, what they felt that, that they could do to, to make an impact and how they thought we could add value. Um, I think in my time there, I think we worked with, with over 100 companies um, that were in the program. And um, what we would do is, is we would assign each of them an executive in residence that would really be their, their assigned lead, um, help them look at their business on a, on a weekly basis. And uh, we had a variety of executives in residence that ranged from people who had done manufacturing to investing, uh, you know, across the gamut to retail. And we would rotate them based on kind of what the company was going through, what their needs were. Um, and I was an advisor for, for companies um, for, for more than a few years there. And, and, you know, you really get into the nitty gritty on a weekly basis. A lot of times I would call it, uh, you know, startup therapy. Uh, you've been in those conversations where people are just like, I can't take it anymore. Like, it's just not worth it. And you're like, no, you can do this, you know, grabbing someone by the collar and like, don't give up now. It's, it's too early. Uh, or sometimes being like, you should give up. <laughs> it's, it's not going to, it's not going to play out. I, we've all been here for months now and we're trying to figure this out and we can't figure it out. Um, the people need that, you know, it's, it's that human connection. And we, you know, we help the companies raise money. We help them, you know, perfect their, their pitches and, and um, you know, their investor decks and made introductions. I'd also say too, that connection with um, the public sector is really important. So whether it was the utility and kind of opening their, their hearts and minds around different kinds of technologies that they could test out and letting them get comfortable with the people and the technology behind some of this innovation so they can look at doing rebates or look at how to innovate, you know, integrate that into projects. That's really important. Uh, but also people at agencies so that, you know, they can get a sense of, of what innovation is out there and connect with a community that's focused on that. And then one of the, the things that I did there um, as a program that I'm, I'm most proud of is, is we started an artist in residence uh, program while I was there. And that really was a result of me meeting a, another art, an artist uh, here in LA and touring the campus again, that that tour again, I've done it thousands of times. Where uh, we just talked about the, the value of bringing the art, art community in to mix with these folks who are working on uh, businesses to, to help create positive impact in the world, and how that could help them approach things from different perspective and open and open their minds to ways to solve problems. Um, and uh, that program has, has taken off, and you know, those artists are actually using the prototyping center to create art. And doing that and bringing in um, the startup founders to work with them on some of these projects, that to me is the heart of sort of, you know, a radical approach to, to some of these challenges. Hopefully I answered your question question in there somewhere. Yeah, let's let's hear from um, Boston. I, I'd like to uh, bring John Cleveland into this. Uh, John, could you just, first of all, describe what the Green Ribbon Commission is, what it does? how long it's been around. And then um, I'd like you to answer the question that I know many people are asking, which is, why don't we have one of these in Boston? <laughs> I'm with you, Ted. <laughs> Great, uh, thank you. Um, and I, I should say before I get started that uh, Ted um, was a robust member of the Green Ribbon Commission for many years when he was heading up the Boston Architectural College. So it's great to reconnect. So. So the Green Ribbon Commission uh, has been around for um, uh, just a little over a decade. We started in 2010, and it is a, um, a voluntary network, CEO network, designed to support and accelerate the implementation of the City of Boston's Climate Action Plan. And I think it's just important to understand, it's not a, the name commission is sort of misleading. It's a totally voluntary network, doesn't even have a legal structure. And it was brought together um, in 2010 by a combination of two forces. Uh, one was the city of Boston had its first climate action plan, a um, real serious action plan in 2009. And a local foundation called the Barr Foundation headed by Amos Hostetter uh, made a commitment to put $50 million into climate related grant making over, um, over five years. And the, the mayor and Amos connected over that because both of those things happen at the same time. And one of the questions they asked was, it becomes really obvious when you look at long-term climate goals of resilience and carbon neutrality, did you get to transform all your urban systems? 
And so the question is, where's the business and civic leadership table where we have the conversation about those transformations and get all these sectors in the city aligned and, uh, and, 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 and focused on it. And, it and, and there just wasn't an existing entity in the city that could play that role. So that's why they created the, the, the Green Ribbon Commission. So, um, you know, listening to this and, and, and my, my reaction was, we, we should have one of these in Boston. <laughs> this is like so cool. And I think one of the things that's cool about it is it really does embody the kind of structural innovation that we all have to start thinking about doing um, if we are going to meet the climate challenges in collaboration with all the other challenges that we're facing. And um, you know, it just struck me, we need to do what this cent the La Crete Center is trying to do, but we need to do it at the scale of the entire city. And, and some of the characteristics when I was listening to Kelly and Alice and Ben talk about sort of how this did, that just really stuck out to me is, um, one was this, this whole idea of structural collaboration across these non-typical parties who typically don't do serious things with each other. And when, you, when I listened to Kelly about how that happened, it happened because there were champions who had a vision in their head and they were willing to really think and work outside of the box and, and really think about doing things in fundamentally um, different ways. It brought the discipline of design as an integrating um, feature. It created a set of standards about what actual sustainability looks like. Stayed focused on human-centered design, so it's about people and about engagement. But then as also, as I was listening, it's also about building an innovation ecology, you know, building these networks and relationships. And in a way, that's one of the things that the Green Ribbon Commission has really been trying to do, is we've been trying to build a climate-related innovation ecology across these various sectors. We have higher education institutions, we have uh, finance, we have healthcare, we have cultural institutions, commercial real estate, both the utilities. And the interesting thing, since it's been together for 10 years now, is there are, and a lot of the people on the commission have been been there for 10 years. They have built sets of relationships between themselves that they didn't have before. And, you know, social capital is a structural asset. It's not just a nice thing to have. And that has now allowed people to start to think about um, how could we do things fundamentally different. Um, and, and, and I think we're, we're, and I think multiple cities across the world are at this stage. Um, and as, as Anne-Marie said, our, our nonprofit has worked with the Urban Sustainability Director, C40, Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance, and, and just a, a lot of cities who are at this. And, and everybody now has plans in place. Everybody knows what needs to be done. The question is, how are you going to do it? And so we're now at the stage where we really, where, and where we need fundamentally new institutions to do it. Ted is familiar with, you know, Boston. Um, you know, when you look at what four feet of sea level rise is going to do to the city of Austin, 25% of our core downtown neighborhoods will flood on every high tide. Well, well, the city's just like not going to work. So we have about $4 billion worth of infrastructure, resilience related infrastructure projects. And there is nobody in the city who has the responsibility to do that. We have to create a whole new asset class for infrastructure. So um, it was really inspiring to me just to listen to your story about the about the Lecrette Center because I think it had so many of those aspects and then my head kept going to well what would it look like to do that at, at the city scale and not at a project scale so anyway thanks for letting me let me in and, and listen it was really cool okay so but again I want to invite uh, the folks in the class to send in their questions so that we can get uh, as much participation as as possible, and I don't want to dominate this uh, this discourse at this moment, but I do want to know um, more about how LA made this happen. Um, it, it, who strong armed whom? Um, who actually owns the real estate? Who was in the room cutting the deals? And I don't, you know, need to know personally, but is this a, a commercial real estate deal? Is this a city mandated deal? Is this a deal that came about because the university said, we don't usually uh, cooperate with each other, so we're gonna try to do it now? I mean, how do you get this to happen? And particularly, 
in a place like Boston, which is a smaller city, uh, many more uh, universities, uh, significant wealth, um, a, a deep commercial base, and real estate. And I'm thinking specifically here about uh, starting with that parcel of land that has come to be known as Widet Circle, uh, which is across the street from uh, our city hospital and from the Boston University Medical Center. It has been transformed from being uh, literally a, a kind of meat market, meat distribution center. Um, and it has been purchased and a new developer has shown up. And what he's saying that he wants to do in the middle of the city of Boston is turn it into a big Amazon warehouse. Now, the question is, if you had a parcel like that, and it was surrounded by universities and surrounded by good transportation, how would you, in fact, bring people together uh, to make something like what you've just shown happen right in the middle of the city of Boston? So I, I'm, I'm asking all of the uh, uh, panelists here, who made this happen? Was it the mayor? Was it Garcetti? Um, I met Villa, Villa, North, Villa Ragosa uh, when he was mayor. He was thought of as a kind of wild and crazy guy. And yet, right? And yet, he was an absolute visionary when it came to redeveloping um, innovative areas, redeveloping the downtown around the arts and theater district. Uh, doing a lot of historic preservation, um, working with sports teams so that they could develop. How does this actually happen? I Ted, I think it, it, it absolutely started um, with the mayor's office and his team, um, um, Antonio Villaragosa, but it was such a large public-private partnership and that you it, it just all had to line up and so at the time you had uh mayor Villaragosa saying this is this is our vision for a green economy in los angeles and i'm willing to use my political capital um to encourage the ladwp um which you know, is a separate entity, but its board is appointed, the five commissioners are appointed by the mayor um, to say, this is what I think you need to be looking at. And so you had you had the mayor, you had LADWP, and then you had um, the Community Redevelopment Agency. And they had a staff of, uh, you know, a lot of, you know, in LA or in California, the redevelopment agency uh, under the Brown administration was, you know, uh, discontinued and there's a lot of talk of you know did it overstep or misuse its resources um, it was really designed around you know to provide for affordable housing and some other things and, and did it uh, go away but I, I think one of the, the positives that create that came out of the redevelopment agency is that you had this very professional staff who understood uh, social investment and um, and, and redevelopment in some of the areas that many on the private side uh, would write off and say, no, we're not going to go there. And the redevelopment agency, um, that was their charge to really look at that. So you combine a vision from the mayor saying, yes, this is, I, I want this to happen and empowering his staff to do it. Um, and then going and um, using and, and partnering with the other city departments. I think John talked about the social capital and how you have people who work together for so long and it allows them then to be able to um, trust each other and to think out of the box and, and be really creative about, uh, around problem solving, problem solving. And for the clean tech incubator, we had all the administrations changed and many of us, you know, did the, move, you know, uh, uh, change chairs and all of that. We stayed within the project. So regardless of what hat I was wearing, I stayed connected to the project. Um, Steve Andrews wore multiple hats. Um, Sharon G was another one. She worked at the redevelopment agency. When that was sunsetted, she became a consultant. I mean, we all just stayed over these 10 years of working with each other and trusting each other. And it was like we were going into battle. There were times where 
um, we needed to get approvals uh, for, for the, from the legislative bodies, either the head of the department, I mean, the Department of Water and Powers Commission to approve all of this funding. You know, you're asking a, a water and part power agency to embrace new market tax credits or to, you know, its mission was to provide safe and reliable water and power, period. And yet we were asking it to use its um, public resources, you know, um, fees that they get from their, from their customers to spur economic development and the clean tech. Um, there are many uh, commission meetings and at least one in particular that I went to to present this project to seek approval from them that despite, you know, I, I've been in politics, uh, at that point, I'd been in it for almost 20 years. And so I was trying to, you know, I, I knew the rough and, you know, tumble of politics and, and working behind the scenes and, and all of that. And I, you know, I pride myself on being able to count my votes, right? Going, you know, knowing that I was going to have the votes needed lined up before I went and made my presentation. Um, this was an instance where I really didn't know if the votes were going to come through and into the, you know, that I'm presenting and I'm hoping they're going to push the right button. And there were times where they didn't. And so then I had to scramble and ask for a continuation and go back and talk to uh, the various, you know, bosses and say, hey, the commission is not, it doesn't look like the commission is going to do the right thing here. You may need to call them or you may need to remind them that this is a priority for you. And I did that for in both administrations. And so, um, that happened and it you know so it did you know Ted to your point require very strong um leadership um I don't know if I twisted arms but I, I definitely used the art of persuasion um and let them know that how important this was and it would be legacy building and that they needed to you know really have a little faith that this team that we had that all had come together oh we lost you You just drop the mic. That, that's how this. That's how the, that, that works in these sessions. <laughs> okay. Oh no. <laughs> well, then then let me ask a related question of of uh, uh, others. How did you get the nonprofits to work with each other? I mean, usually there's so much internal hubris and and ego uh, around running a nonprofit. Though I see you're shaking your head, right? So how do you get organizations? that presumably share a mission to decide that they're going to work with each other? Well, you know, maybe you want, I can probably answer this question, I guess, to start a little bit for the project itself. Um, you know, I think this is a big issue in the nonprofit world. You, you Oftentimes you have people fighting over limited resources and kind of all hurting each other. Uh, collaboration is so important. And I think when it comes to the issue of climate change in particular, we're, we're fighting a much, much bigger fight. Uh, and we all need to, to, I think, get a little bit beyond our own egos or our own uh, constraints or resource desires for our own organizations. So uh, I think in particular for this community, um, everyone had a slightly different mission, but saw, saw the power in being connected to each other and the ability to leverage each other's networks. Um, and. I think if you position things that way, it, it can be beneficial for, for everyone. Kelly, I'm sorry we lost you. I, I, yes, technical difficulties abound. But I was just saying it required strong leadership and lots of partnerships. And, and Alice mentioned all of the other partners with the universities, everyone really speaking about the importance of this project from you know many different arenas. I think it helped people give them the political cover, I, if I would say, to, to, to do the right thing and um, to be creative in our funding and everything else that we were trying to do. So, so um, you're obviously describing a process that's, that's fairly political. Which were the leading groups, the leading stakeholders in driving this forward? And in retrospect, um, although it's, it's very much alive, but in terms of its formative uh, stages, looking back at the formation, who might have been left out of that process, if anyone? You know, I, I often ask um, in doing projects, who's not at the table? 
you know, it, it's the first question I, I, I default to of looking around and making sure whose voice is not being heard here. Um, but I think one of the um, attributes of this problem is that the, the one, the table was large, the tent was large, and we invited many people in. So I don't know if anyone was left out. We did have the university, and I mean, you have both USC and UCLA there, and if you know anything, <laughs> they are uh, rivals, and that rivalry is real. And I think, um, you know, we, you know, Alice talked about why they situated there. One of the jokes was it was inconvenient for everyone. Right, so it was equally inconvenient uh, for uh, those from UCLA to get to downtown from USC. Maybe they had a little bit easier from Pasadena when you had JPL and Caltech. So it was just, it, so that, that was one thing. You had every business organization or the main ones, right? Who normally have their own agenda of working. They all came together and said, we all support this as well. You had two mayors who, you know, when we had, we had multiple groundbreakings because literally it was happening as the transition was happening. So uh, Mayor Antonio Villaraigosa, his last day in office was June 30th, you know, 2013. So it was, he was like, you are going to cut a ribbon and dig a hole before I leave. I have spent too much of my time. So that is happening. Well, we had to make an event because there it was, we hadn't really started yet, but we, we made an event. And so you had the mayor and the mayor left. By this point, uh, Garcetti had been elected. He was taking office on July 1st of 2013. So uh, you had both of them there for that. And then once it was, you know, it was opening, you did another grand opening. So we had lots of ribbon cuttings and that was important. People talk about, oh, you know, that's optics and you shouldn't worry about that. It's like, no, if these people put their names on the line and their political capital, give this to them. And it helps to keep people engaged, people to keep elected officials and stakeholders engaged to say along the way, uh, let's um, acknowledge the small victories along the way as well and not just wait until the very end. And that was important to keep people engaged. So um, it, it was interesting. It, I, I, you know, it was probably the, the most difficult project that I have been involved in in my professional career, but also the most rewarding. Um, it, it, Kelly and Ben, I have a follow-up question to Ted's question, which is given that the, you know, the LADWP and the universities and these players built relationships by coming together around this project, did, have they gone on to do any other interesting things together as a result of sort of having built that kind of set of relationships around the La Crete Center? I, you know, I would say it's, it's, it's not just maybe those, those groups in particular, it's all the people who've been connected through the building. Uh, and there's countless stories of companies okay. now working with the utility, with the city, with each other, being connected to different groups or having met someone at an event on site. So, um, you know, I can tell you there's there's probably hundreds of those connections at a minimum that have gone on to do that. And that's that power of having that centralized sort of- that, Yeah, um, yeah, that, that sort of network incubator design. Okay, great, great. That's, that's, that's really interesting. Who, who actually pays the bills for this? I can break down at least the operational piece a little bit, if that's helpful, because I saw no, that. on the operational question. side, because yeah. if people are thinking and doing this, and-, and yeah, Kelly can break down the 12 capital partners in the stack if she wants to do that. But uh, yeah. um, on the operational side, it's, so it's, it's a little bit of a mixed bag. The LA Department of Water and Power that owns the building uh, has a contract with the, the Clean Tech Incubator to manage the building. Um, and so that covers a lot of the core operational expenses for security, for parking, you know, those, those sorts of things. And then uh, tenants do, do pay costs. I think it's really important, even for startups that they need to learn how to pay for things, just, just like kids. Uh, and so uh, we would try to match the costs to, you know, kind of what the minimum was they could afford as a startup. Uh, but then, you know, frankly, ramp it up from there as, as they grow. And then a lot of our community partners paid, paid for their desk space, just like they would at a normal co-working space. And we had market rates that we sent out for that sort of thing. Um, so, Hopefully that helps, at least on the operational side. I'm, I'm curious, uh, we're being promised some significant infrastructure investment uh, and infrastructure investment funding that's uh, directed at least in part 
to achieving higher levels of social justice at the same time we're looking at economic development. If you are now looking forward beyond this project, what are the things that you imagine investing in of this type or of some other type in LA that would be the next plateau that would, uh, among other things, demonstrate what it, have you, what it is you've learned from this project? So one of the, so in my current role, uh, I help lead the Los Angeles office of AECOM, large uh, engineering infrastructure uh, firm. And so, um, from what the, are the two or three largest in the world? Perhaps. Uh, and so we have been working with many of our clients, public sector clients, from the start of this pandemic. Uh, we knew early on that there was going to be some sort of stimulus dollars. And so talking to our cities and our clients about, you know, what sort of projects, what we learned from last time was that a lot of the infrastructure projects that were funded were uh, public works projects. Now they, they did keep some people, but can, couldn't we do better on this round? Could we really look at um, green jobs and a different kind of jobs and create career pathways using the dollars that we are that we assume we're going to uh, flow eventually to um, to kind of repair the, the the pandemic and the economic loss that uh, that we've all experienced here. So we started that early on in Los Angeles. Uh, it has the city has its own version of the Green New Deal, where they set very far reaching. Um, goals and they call them, you know, their five zeros: uh, zero carbon waste, zero waste water, you know, zero uh, greenhouse gases. All of these things, the five zeros. And so we are working with them now to develop a green and just recovery plan, right? Of okay, what are the sorts of projects and programs um, bounded or um, grounded in this new green new deal that they can start preparing and developing that can receive stimulus funding for that will create um, jobs, both labor jobs uh, for exist those who are currently in the labor market, but helping to um, bring new people into the workforce and to transition into that. So um, not just jobs, but uh, good paying, you know, uh, uh, jobs. The other thing is, uh, can the projects reduce greenhouse gas? You know, can we do that? So the tying the, you know, for every dollar invested, you know, we're used to doing for every dollar invested, you're going to create X amount of jobs. Well, for every dollar invested, can you codify um, greenhouse gas reductions? And so um, I, do, and because of the work that the city has done around this clean tech, I think they are in a, in a position um, to be ready to use their stimulus dollars in a way that will be, you know, we talk about triple bottom line, quadruple bottom line, that will have an impact far and beyond of just kind of putting people back to work. But how do you really um, create uh, career pathways and changing uh, communities and uh, repairing? One of the things they're looking at is, you know, existing oil and drill sites. Can you use uh, future um, stimulus dollars to uh, close and repurpose these drill sites. Something that the community has been advocating for for years. So we're going to look at all of these things. And I'll just ask uh, one last question. Um, we, we tend to look at very large projects um, as these kinds of uh, transformative uh, initiatives. Um, have you seen uh, how smaller projects might also uh, work and I'll just say from my own perspective, the amount of work that goes into a small project is not fundamentally different than the amount of work that goes into a large project, um, and you can project a larger impact. So part of the the challenge is uh, how one goes about justifying pouring that much uh, work uh, and and effort uh, three or four years into a project that is a 15,000 square foot project as opposed to a 100,000 square foot project. But are there smaller projects that you might envision that um, uh, might have a, a similar kind of impact? 
we do large. So I'm gonna. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, I, I might touch on this That's room. Because... Com, right. <laughs> I think so. I, I'll let Alice or or Ben. Maybe they can. They know some smaller projects, but. I, my, I, my, I, I, I like I us think, to do large projects. I think size, you know, has importance to a certain degree. But also, I, you know, in my, in my role here at USGBCLA, we work on a lot of smaller community projects that can have an amazing impact. Um, I, I don't think it's about the size of the project. I think it's really about the intent and its ability to bring people together. Um, but I, you know, I've seen, you know, pocket parks no bigger than, you know, two or three car lengths have a big impact Absolutely. on their local community uh, and provide that space for action for innovation it's just about being, being focused I and mean, i think see a lot of really interesting work right now specific, specifically around green infrastructure uh in our communities whether that's um bringing bringing more nature into areas that frankly don't have a lot of, of public green space um there's a lot of benefits with that uh and i and i think what we're seeing right now with this whole concept of you know building back better and, and infrastructure investments it's it's so important that we're going to have this equity lens to it because uh, we haven't been intentional about that in the past, uh, and we have we have a lot of work to undo uh, and redo better this time around if, if we can. Uh, and you look at some of the impacts that we've seen, um, you know, just in this this last year, you know, everything everything's related. Like right? where we have a lack of green infrastructure, a lack of public space, a lack of ability to to access, you know, uh, uh, local food, uh, you know, connect the 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 being close to, to pollution from freeways. All these things have shown that we have higher likelihood of, of COVID cases. We have a higher likelihood of all these things is because we have parts of our society that are just not getting the, the investment and lift up the way that they need. And we're seeing the impacts of that in, in this way. Well, well I, I do, I do think ahead. that, Ted, I just wanted to answer also just from um, the architect's perspective a little bit, because you're absolutely right, the small projects end up being actually more work than the big projects, you know, because you have to, in terms of design, you have to design every square inch, large projects, you know, there's just this economies of scale and that's true for the cost also. So I don't think anybody denies the impact and the social impact of the smaller projects, but we still have to figure out a way to make them, um, you know, less expensive and also scalable. So I think that's sort of the answer that if, you know, if there are ways that small projects can be replicated, then all of a sudden, you know, you get this economy of scale even from a small project. So if you have a pocket park that can be repeated 200 times all throughout the city in terms of many of its elements and just sort of customized in, you know, certain ways, site specific, but really that I think is, is part of the answer to really being able to um, um, really get the most out of these smaller projects. And the smaller projects, of course, are really important. I saw a question in the in the chat because the smaller, more grassroots organizations are the ones who can actually develop and run and organize these projects. And that's really important, I think, also to have communities have their sort of, you know, input from within. And I think that's really important. Um, you know, housing is another huge, huge issue, I think. And to me, housing actually does fall into this uh, equation as well. And in LA, homelessness is, is huge, huge, huge issue. Um, I think, I think Boston, from my understanding, you have a big problem, but it's not as big as New York's um, or LA's. And so, but I think in Los Angeles, homelessness has sort of overtaken in a, in a lot of ways, kind of, um, um, many, many other issues in terms of the importance and the kinds of funds that have to kind of go into looking at that. And that's also has a lot to do, of course, with equity and everything else. But so I think your question is really interesting because the small projects are so important, as you say, and as Ben said, just said, but they're expensive. They're unaffordable per square foot. And we have to figure out a way that that can just not be the case. Um, so I think that's important. Well, I, I think this has been a, a fascinating, intriguing uh, conversation, um, and I'm sure that a lot of people will carry on with some of the thoughts. We, um, in Boston, um, for a variety of reasons, starting with, you know, Celtics, Lakers, don't like to think a whole lot about uh, uh, West Coast envy uh, in this regard, but I, I don't know of anyone who knows of this project uh, who who doesn't wish we had one uh, uh, similar um, or even city size as, as John has suggested. So 
Um, I want to thank you. Um, it's been an absolutely intriguing and inspiring conversation. And with that, I'll turn this back over to Anne Marie. Thank you, Ted. And one thing I wanted to mention before I forget, uh, Alice mentioned the importance of addressing the issue of homelessness in so many different cities. And actually it was in part through a conversation we had with Alice um, in connection with this session that we um, put together one on ending homelessness that's coming up in a couple weeks and will involve uh, her partner, um, John Friedman, as well as several people involved in Rudy Bruner award-winning projects. So, uh, but I'd also just like to extend my thank you to um, Alice and Ben and Kelly and John. It's such an honor to know all of you and to get to become um, even more familiar with the work and the impact that you are all having in both Boston and Los Angeles. Uh, just a reminder that this session has been recorded. It will be available on both the Myra Craft and the Rudy Bruner Award uh, websites. Uh, our website will have additional resources that have been mentioned by our panelists today. So to check that out, um, if you're interested in getting AIA CEUs, you still have time to find the link in the chat box and fill them out. Uh, next week, we are going to focus on the creation of inclusive and resilient public spaces. We have uh, three panelists will be joining us who are the leaders of the Van Allen Institute in New York City and two award-winning landscape architecture firms, uh, one of which designed the Steel Yard in Providence, are one of our 2013 Rudy Bruner Award silver medalists. So thank you, everybody, and we hope we will see you next week. Thank you and good night.